So let's talk about some limitations to Mendelian randomization. Um, whilst MR is a very powerful and exciting method, like all methods, it relies on assumptions and it has limitations. I'm going to talk about five of these, in particular the last two on this slide, but I just want to mention um, three uh, other limitations. So we've talked a little bit about population stratification. So population stratification, if it's present, has the potential to reintroduce confounding into an MR analysis. So very important that your MR analysis is performed on ancestrally similar uh, individuals and you can um, uh, correct for population stratification using, for example, ancestry informative principle components if possible. Number two is this concept called canalization or developmental compensation. And this is kind of the idea that um, if an individual has a deleterious um, mutation, then the effect of that mutation could be buffered by developmental compensations. And what this would mean for Mendelian randomization is that the um, uh, SNP effect estimates, in particular the estimates of the uh, SNP outcome association, may not accurately reflect if you were to, um, the causal estimates that you get from that MR analysis would not accurately reflect what would happen if you um, perturbed your exposure using other means like a, a drug or, or something like that. Um, it's very difficult to um, assess whether um, these sorts of developmental compensations are um, present in, in um, the genome and, and human development. Um, so we've kind of got to um, rely on, on faith that uh, this is not kind of a serious impediment to Mendelian randomization analysis. Number three is the existence of genetic instruments. So for some exposures, um, we may just not have any um, known variants that are robustly associated with those um, exposures. Obviously, as the size of GWAS increase, then um, this limitation is becoming less and less relevant because um, with resources like UK Biobank and these other big cohorts, um, GWAS is doing a very good job of identifying um, robust genetic associations of these exposures. So let's talk a little bit about the last two limitations. So let's talk about power and weak instrument bias first. So these are two different but related concepts. So recall that statistical power is basically the probability of demonstrating a causal effect when one is in fact present. Um, and the thing is, is that because the genetic variants used in Mendelian randomization analysis only explain very small amounts of phenotypic variants in the exposure, um, MR analysis has really low power. So in general, you need very large sample sizes in order to significantly demonstrate causal effects. Um, Fortunately, that's becoming easier nowadays because of the existence of these large cohort studies. Um, and in indeed, um, two sample Mendelian randomization studies as well, where um, they're often based on very large publicly available summary GWAS statistics. Now, weak instruments and weak instrument bias is a concept that's related to power, but it's slightly different. Now, it also arises in part because the genetic variants that we use for MR analysis are only weakly related to the exposure. And the problem arises is that if you do an MR analysis with a variant that's um, only very weakly related to the exposure and you don't have um, a lot of individuals in your analysis, not only will you have low power, but actually the estimate you get of that causal effect 
is going to be biased. And that's what's referred to as weak instrument bias. So in MR studies, it's very important to only use SNPs where you have robust evidence for um, a relationship between the genetic markers and the exposure. And you do it in as large a sample as possible. So both those factors will mitigate the effect of weak instrument bias. And interestingly enough, the effect of weak instrument bias depends on whether you're performing a single sample MR study or a two sample MR study. So in single sample MR, the direction of bias is to the confounded estimate. So in other words, if um, there's no association and no causal association that's actually present, but there is a confounded phenotypic association, then your uh, estimate of the causal effect will be biased towards the phenotypic association. In contrast, in uh, two sample Mendelian randomization, the direction of bias is towards null, so towards zero. So what can we do um, to improve the power of Mendelian randomization analysis? Well, one thing we can do is we can use multiple genetic variants as instruments. So for many traits, there's not just one particular genetic variant that's associated with our exposure, but multiple uh, genetic variants that show association. So one thing we can do is we could construct an allelic score to see whether um, the allelic score is a, 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 a more powerful um, instrument and, and, and use that in our Mendelian randomization analysis. So typically allelic scores comprised of several genetic variants, they'll explain more variants in the exposure variable than single genetic variants. So that's one way to increase your um, power. We could test multiple variants individually and then meta-analyze them together. So um, all the uh, different SNPs should provide the same estimate of the causal effect um, if there's no pleiotropy operating. So if we then meta-analyze estimates of those causal effects, then that should also improve our power and precision as well. There is a useful uh, web-based utility um, which will calculate power uh, in Mendelian randomization studies for you. It's hosted at the University of Queensland, um, where I'm based. It was developed by MJ um, Brian, formerly from the University of, of Bristol, then University of Queensland. Um, and if you go to this website, um, it's uh, very easy to, to use, um, and you'll be able to calculate um, power for your MR studies, which is very useful for things like grant applications. So let's talk about pleiotropy last of all. So by pleiotropy, I mean that a genetic variant influences more than one trait. And I'd like to distinguish between two sorts of pleiotropy, horizontal pleiotropy and vertical pleiotropy. So vertical pleiotropy is where you have this kind of cascade structure. So you have a genetic variant that affects an exposure, which in turn affects an outcome. And it's kind of this sort of cascading or, or, or vertical structure. Now, this is not problematic for Mendelian randomization. In, in fact, um, Mendelian randomization is based on vertical pleiotropy because we're using a genetic variant to proxy an exposure which in turn influences an outcome. But what is problematic for MR is the presence of horizontal pleiotropy. So this is where you have a genetic variant that influences uh, exposure and outcome through different pathways. So to make this a little bit more clear um, when horizontal pleiotropy is problematic, consider um, these two DAGs. So in one of these, um, the presence of horizontal pleiotropy is problematic for Mendelian randomization analysis. 
And it's the second of these examples. In the first, yes, there is horizontal pleiotropy, but the second path from the genetic variant to B2 doesn't influence the outcome. So it's not affecting the association between the genetic variant and the outcome. In contrast, on the right-hand side of the panel, B2 does affect the outcome. So in this particular situation, horizontal pleiotropy is problematic for Mendelian randomization analysis.